In this module, we will be dealing with one specific subject called testing and design for testability. Design for testability is abbreviated as DFT, which is very distinct from discrete Fourier transform. So this subject might at first sound like it is peripheral and not as important as the uh, main uh, subject behind other modules, but in fact, it's really critical. So what is testing? Uh, we will talk more about what testing is in the next video, what the uh, specific definition is, but testing is basically making sure that your product works. In this case, the product is a finished chip, and we have to make sure that the chip is working or functioning properly. So we have to define a few things first before we can talk about why design for testability is such a, a difficult uh, subject. First of all, we have to define what design for testability is. When we start talking about testing, when we start talking about how we can test the chip to make sure that it's working, we will find that we need to add a lot of additional hardware to the finished chip just to ensure that we can test it. So this amount of hardware is significant. It's not uh, like 5% more hardware. It's more close to the range of 30 to 50% more hardware. So you could have uh, half as much real estate devoted just to allowing your main chip to be testable as you have to the core of the chip. So one way to look at, the, at, the, uh, at this issue is uh, illustrated here in this image where we have something called the circuit under test, CUT. This is similar to the unit under test or UUT, which we talked about uh, with the test benches in, in, in VHDL. The difference is of course that test benches in VHDL usually refer to software test benches, and thus we are talking about a unit under test. Here we're talking about hardware, uh, things that are realized in a finished commercial chip, and so we're talking about a circuit under test. And then there's a bunch of uh, additional hardware, which is uh, hardware added for design for testability, and it's within the boundaries of the chip. So it, it actually is, uh, you know, uh, it goes through the same design cycle that the main chip goes through. And usually the DFT hardware stands in the middle between uh, inputs and outputs and between the core of the chip. So that's one way to look at it. But this is a very neat way to look at it because we are allowing the design for testability hardware and the hardware, the core hardware of the circuit under test to be completely separate. This is usually not the case. We will just shortly see that uh, the DFT hardware is usually intertwined with the core of the chip. And there's no way that you can separate the two into neat modules, usually. Sometimes you can, but usually you cannot. So the whole area of study of design for testability is focused on finding efficient tests for chips and figuring out the additional hardware that you need to add to enable these tests and how this hardware can be efficiently designed. Again, this is not a peripheral subject. This is integral to uh, allowing us First of all, to ensure that our designs work, and secondly, to ensure that our finished products are also functional. So let's dive deeper into a few definitions that will help us along the way. Let's figure out what a test is to begin with. So let's assume that you have a finished chip. One of the main problems with a finished chip or even a, uh, a VHDL design that has, been, that has gone through synthesis and placement and routing is that you no longer have access to internal hardware. What you have access to is the inputs and outputs of the chip. So you only have access to the IO pins, input pins and output pins. These are the only things you can actually control and observe. So you can control the input pins and you can observe the output pins. How can you make sure that this chip is functional? How can you make sure that it is good, quote unquote? So, Good means that the chip is doing what it's supposed to do and that I can ship it out to a, a customer and he wouldn't return it to me. That's simply what it means. So the way we can do this is by going through a process called, called testing. So the process of making sure that the chip works is called testing. 
And when we say the word test, we usually mean a pattern that we apply to the input. So the pattern that you apply to the input is called the test pattern or just the test for short. So this is the pattern that you apply to the input and then you expect to see something at the output. What you do see at the output is called the observation. Now the observation could be correct or incorrect. So you need to compare it to something. And so when you compare it to something, you compare it to a gold standard. And the gold standard is the correct output that you expect to see if the chip is functioning properly. So if you compare the observation to the gold standard and you find that they match, then the chip is functioning properly. But of course, you don't apply a single test, you apply multiple tests. So you have to apply multiple tests to make sure that the chip is functional for all of your uh, inputs, right? So of course, this is a test, a cycle that ensures that the chip is functional, meaning that it produces the output properly. What if you find a mismatch between the gold standard and the observation, then the chip isn't working properly. The test can tell you that the chip is working or not working. But if you want to figure out why it's not working, if you want to figure out which part of the chip particularly has a problem, that's called diagnosis. So diagnosis defines the part of the chip, the submodule where there's a problem, and perhaps can even tell you what the problem is. Maybe there's a set of time violation, maybe there's a whole, whole time violation. Maybe there's something specifically wrong with this block for a specific input to the block. So that's called diagnosis. And of course, obviously, it's a higher level of testing than just a functional test. So now let's look at the specific issue that has to do with testing and design for testability. And it would expose us to the first kind of additional hardware that we need to add to a chip to make sure that it can be tested. Let's consider this very simple chip, which cons consists of seven submodules, each of which can contain multiple gates, and they're connected in the way shown in the, in the figure. Now, let's assume uh, that you have a problem that you detect by applying tests to the inputs and observing the outputs, and then you find that the outputs mismatch the gold standard. You have a nagging suspicion that there might be a problem with submodule 5. So you want to make sure that submodule 5 is functioning properly. You just need to isolate the problem and you have a suspicion that it's submodule 5 that's giving you trouble. Or you have gone through other submodules and now need to go through submodule 5. This is kind of the tracing and debugging cycle that most people go through. So the problem with submodule 5 is that it is not reachable. You cannot test it. Because if you want to test something, you need to be, to, to be able to apply inputs to that something and then observe the outputs. Now, the input to module 5 is an internal signal because D is an internal signal. And the output from module 5 is an internal signal because G is an internal signal. And so we cannot control the input to module 5. And so we have a controllability problem. And we cannot observe the outputs of module 5. We have an observability problem. Specifically, we do not have access to these nodes through input and output pins. Modules 1 and 2, for example, are directly controllable because their inputs are also input pins. Outputs from modules 7 and 6 are directly observable because they are also connected to output pins. If you think at the scale of a realistic chip, then you have hundreds of thousands, maybe hundreds of millions of gates inside the core of the chip, and you have perhaps a few hundred pins. So at that scale, the majority of your nodes, the overwhelming majority, are neither directly controllable or directly observable. You might protest by saying that node D, for example, is not directly controllable, but maybe it is indirectly controllable through module 2. Or that observing the output of module 5 can be done by observing the output of module 7 under certain circumstances, which is true but again, think at the level of a realistic chip where you have very deep pipelines, where you have modules that are buried really deep in the pipeline. How can you reach them? The only way you can reach these internal nodes is to bring them out to output pins. And so 
you need to bring this out to an output pin and you need to bring this out so you need to bring this out to an input pin and you need to bring this out to an output pin which you can do but there's a couple of problems here the first problem is with pin count you usually have a very lim limited number of pin counts and the other problem is also that you don't actually want this node node d to be controlled from the external input in most normal operation you want it to come as the output of module 2 you just want it in certain circumstances when you are doing a test to come from, from an external pin so the way to deal with this is to perhaps have a multiplexer at the input of module 5 and in that case the input to module 5 can be multiplexed between a test case which is the line on the right and a normal operation case which is the line on the left and this multiplexing can be done through a mode select signal which is the select line of the multiplexer the good thing about this is that in test mode module 2 is irrelevant so we can actually use the same input pin that is feeding module 2 to feed the test input of module 5 when we are testing this allows us to control the number of pins and it can also be used at the output in a very similar way so that we can use the output pin either to produce a normal output or the output of some internal node in which we are interested through multiplexing now is there a systematic way perhaps in which this can be done for larger circuits so that we can have access to multiple nodes without increasing the number of pins the answer is yes and the field of study which gives you this answer is called design for testability so this is one area in which you have to add an additional hardware specifically to allow you to have more controllability and observability on internal nodes so that you can do diagnosis of issues if they arise and you need a systematic way to do this because why are we concerned with module 5 only like maybe the problem is with module 4 or 3 and again think at the level of a realistic chip with a very deep pipeline so there has to be a systematic way in which this can be done and we have to look at it